When I'm driving a car, I feel like I'm watching a movie. And when I'm riding my bike, I feel like I'm in the movie. And, 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 and it's like, just like you're, you're part of it. Uh, you, you know, and it's not all just nature. It's like, you know, when I, when I ride by the taco trucks in LA, I smell the taco trucks. I hear all the languages that people are talking as they're walking around. I like smell the fresh cut grass as guys are working on people's lawns. It's, it's, um, you know, it's not like I'm in this living room listening to a podcast, no offense to podcasts. It's just like I'm out there experiencing the world I live in. And it's really easy to get disconnected fr from that. Like the bicycle is an incredible way to make you feel more connected to where you are. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Peter Flax, the author of the new book, Live to Ride, Finding Joy and Meaning on a Bicycle. Uh, we're gonna go into this new book, uh, which by the way is a beautiful new book uh, that I really think everyone uh, should have. So you know what, let's get right to it with Peter so you can see why. Peter Flax, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Great, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Peter, I love to give my guests just an opportunity to do a really quick uh, introduction. So who the heck is Peter Flax? Uh, Peter Flax is a writer and editor uh, who lives in Los Angeles now. I've been here for about 10 years and I've been uh, writing and editing about a lot of topics, but especially bikes for almost 30 years now. So I uh, have uh, been an editor for more than 30 years and, and writing about bikes since the 90s. I love it. I love it. And uh, and I mentioned to you uh, when I reached out to you about uh, doing this episode that uh, I, I, I kind of have this love-hate relationship with Los Angeles. I'm a fourth generation Los Angelino. Uh, spent many, many years uh, living there. And uh, every time when I'm gone, I miss it. And then when I'm there, I can't wait to leave. How's it, How's your decade been treating you there? Well, it's been great, I guess. It, it uh, right? It, I guess I, probably how anybody would react when they reflect on living somewhere for, for a decade. It, um, as a place to ride, it's thrilling and um, almost always sunny and um, often dramatic. Um, you know, it's not a low key place to ride, but I'm able to ride year round. I don't own a car and I do something like almost 8,000 miles a year, just commuting back and forth to my office. So um, life is good for me in, in that way. And, you know, so much of what my new book comes from is just how I had to reorient my riding life um, after mo moving to LA. And so I now feel kind of warm and fuzzy about the whole thing because I like it, it steered my um, riding life in a way that I didn't expect. Yeah. And, and that's a good point too, because uh, your history, of course, is that you were in the industry, in the bicycle industry, writing about the bicycle industry for many, many years. And, uh, and then that move a, a decade ago, basically in 2014, uh, sort of marked a, a transition for you. You Not only were you changing coasts, you went from the East Coast to the West Coast, but you were also getting, you know, moving away from, you know, writing about, you know, professionally writing about bicycling necessarily every day as part of your J-O-B. Yeah, yeah. When I moved to L.A., I took a, a job with The Hollywood Reporter. And for the first time in a long time, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't getting paid to cover anything bike related. And so I had to find my way um, of what my purpose or role um, in bike culture would, would be. So uh, it, it uh, has been a really interesting experience to stumble in, in, into this, where before I was someone who was, you know, editor of the biggest bike magazine in the, in the U.S., so totally different. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you and I, this is the first time we've had a chance to be face to face, uh, with each other, uh, you know, over the, the, the interwebs over a, a video, uh, phone call here, but this is how I know Peter Flax is <laughs> P Flax one out on uh, Twitter, very, very prolific tweeter out there and, uh, have a very, very strong following. 
this is kind of, this is how I've known you for years. How long have you been really active out there uh, on Twitter, you know, kind of putting content out, talking about bicycling and all things, you know, safer streets and in, in obviously Los Angeles over the last decade? Well, I think I've been on Twitter for almost 15 years. At some point a long time ago, the CEO of the company I worked for, like, forced me to get on and live tweet during like a Al Gore <laughs> debate or something like really <laughs> weird. Um, and I, but I got like really into it maybe like 12, 12 years ago, I guess, 13 years ago. And um, and I, I think found my way and my, my voice le- leaving bicycling and not being affiliated with a bike brand has certainly like freed me up to just um, be – more uh, honest about what I feel. I, d- I definitely, um, b- probably to a fault or beyond that, you know, just say what's on my m- mind. And, um, and, and so I have uh, a lot of people that love to follow me and a lot of people who hate to follow me or hate me. Um, and that's just something I'm okay with. Like, I, like it, it, it is a freeing thing to have a platform where you can just say what you think. What's really interesting too, and, and and you can kind of comment on this, is that that platform and the interactions of you know quote unquote hashtag bike Twitter, and and the audience that is out there. Obviously, we don't have to get too far into the fact that it's changed a little bit in in the last couple of years, but. It's, it was really a, a special place in the sense that there was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, sometimes you get a little bit of vitriol here and there and, 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 and you kind of get some trolls uh, occasionally. But there's also a, an awful lot of camaraderie out there, an awful lot of love out there, and as well as just being able to make connections, even like this connection right here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, if I'm honest, I think that it really has gone to crap in the last couple of years and um, – you know, it, at its peak, which lasted a long time, it was like this incredible community where I constantly was meeting people who expanded my perspectives and who I would commune with over various things I love about bikes. And I made a ton of real friends. And now I'd say at least half the people that I really care about have just bailed on the platform yeah. and and. And just like in so many vertical spaces on Twitter, it's just gotten uh, uglier, but I still find it useful. Um, um, It's still like better to me than my alternatives now. And it's, uh, you know, a great town square for people who love bikes. And and that part of what, um, again, my book touches on is, is that like bike culture is so far from monolithic that there are so many different sides to the community and that Twitter was this place where everyone communed together. And that part of what I've seen in the last 10 years of like things like pro bike racers getting involved in advocacy, a lot of that like happened through conversation on Twitter, like it, like as a platform on the way that people exchanged ideas and, and the polemic conversations that happen, like have really shaped the culture in the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent on, on each of those points. And, uh, and I did pull up, uh, you know, the, I guess the very first, uh, uh, you know, tweet or post that I see here, um, you know, from four hours ago, uh, again, what a lovely book, <laughs> Peter Flax. Thank you for your work on behalf of the entire community of, of cyclists. And, and I think that that's, that's kind of the whole point is this, this really is, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of a love letter to riding a bike and, and there's like no judgment. And I think that's part of what is there. And I'll let you expand upon that is that, you know, if you, if you, if you just, if you're riding, if you're getting out there, you're doing it right. There's no judgment here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, um, this is an idea that, um, has come to me like slowly and relentlessly over the time since I moved to L- LA of when I moved here, realizing that this old idea I had that everyone was in one or two subcultures that defined what kind of rider you were. And then I got here and suddenly felt like 
I'm not really in any of them. Like I have one foot in a bunch of them and I just don't know who I am as a rider. And then slowly realizing that the thing, these things that we love about riding are, are this glue that doesn't get talked about enough and like very um, gratified that you call it a love letter. It's not a term I would use, but I think it, it, it that's what it is. Like it, 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 um, it, it started with me, like I originally wanted to call this book Why We Ride, um, but it turns out someone wrote a motorcycle book of that name, so it was off the table. But it was like an exploration of why I and other people ride independent of like what kind of apparel or bicycle they sit on. And it took like a year of thinking and then two years of writing to um, distill down that thinking into what you just held up. And so um, to have it finally be out in the world and people like tweeting at me that they l loved it is um, r really m moving because it, it's, it, yeah, it was a labor of love. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's really, really special about this is, is you take the readers on a journey uh, uh, and a little bit, you know, starting with with yourself and sort of how you started out with the bicycle. But you take the reader on a journey, and on this journey, you, you introduce us to to several many different characters, and 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 that's what you kind of mentioned there is that it, there's these like little profiles of these interesting and influential people. And, you know, really culminating with what we just talked about is, you know, it, it really isn't necessarily about necessarily our, our tribes that we may have within this, but it really is this concept. If you ride, you're doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the people that are in the book are really important to me that, you know, I mean, I, I'm on, if I'm honest, like I'm a, a lifelong magazine editor. So when I set out to write a book, it, it, it kind of is like in some ways a book length magazine article where just the way I package in um, elements. But I think you can't really capture the just beautiful diversity within this space if you don't talk to the people that like capture the very best of the space. And, and, and so uh, uh, with the exception of uh, Paris Mayor Ann Hidalgo, who I still don't know, I know everybody else well who I interview and profile and, and having them all together in one place is really meaningful to me and hopefully to other people. Yeah. You know, I, I pulled up, uh, you know, sort of the table of contents, the introductions of contents here so that you can see that we have it basically divided up into these six different, uh, chapters or subcategories. Why don't you talk a little bit about how, uh, you, you went about doing that and, and how you decided to, you know, sort of, uh, choose these six as the, the big buckets. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it's as a trivia question, it was originally seven and I had self-expression and beauty as two separate ideas and, I wound up com combining them, but these are like when, after spending like a year thinking about it, were, were these like connective threads that are the things that people love about riding. And, and that like, whether you're a casual transit rider or a hardcore commuter or a mountain biker or uh, a road racer, a triathlete, that these are all things that I think you treasure about your riding life. And, and so each chapter then goes into that idea where I, I substantiate what the idea is about and how it can manifest itself in different ways and go through um, some history that's relevant in that area and equipment that's sort of the best you know, best case of what, what equipment can look like in, in that space, uh, like a dream ride. Um, really, like hopefully in total, people who come into it and think like, oh, like I don't think adventure is part of my riding life. And I, I would, I, mean, I think most people do, but if they didn't, I think when they read it, they'll be like, oh, I, I actually, I do, I do. Like I, I love being on a bike and the way it captures this feeling of being a child again, of discovering things and, and hearing and seeing things that I wasn't expecting um, and, and the same with the other chapters. As I'm looking at these uh, six different uh, areas here, 
I identify with all six of those in, in many different ways across, you know, my embarrassing number of bikes that happen to be in the garage. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. I think some people are, are like least sure about competition. Like the, the amount of people who race bikes in the U S is a relatively small number. And so it's like easiest to dismiss that as something that you're like, well, I'm not, I don't race, but, but then a lot of people are like, Oh, I love using Strava or I love testing myself in some way. Um, that, that the sense of like how you find things out about yourself by testing yourself is, um, pretty universal. Bike is like an incredible thing for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could easily see, I, I see what you mean by the, the competition. I could also see it competition slash sports slash recreation, but you can even say that about, you know, that being captured in some of these other categories as well as such as speed and, and et cetera, and even nature. I mean, it's just, for me, it, it, it was an absolute joy to go through this book and, I have to ask, though, too, I think I know the answer, but what really inspired you to do it as a book? I just felt like it was too big. And I, I mean, I, I've written a lot of um, relatively big magazine stories. Like I've written a bunch of, you know, 10,000 word magazine stories, which is about as big as those get. And this was just too big an idea for that. And that I felt once I started thinking about there, there are relatively few books for bike riders that like aspire to capture something broad about the culture. And that kind of freaked me out, which is good for me, like that I was like, I didn't, it's not like I could go to the bookstore and pick out a book and be like, Oh, this is sort of, I want to update this for like the 2020s. It wasn't like that at, at all. And so I, I guess I decided that I was going to like try and capture a broad perspective of why people ride. Yeah. And I, I, I guess I asked that question the way that I did, uh, you know, fully knowing that, uh, as a journalist, you've, you've, been in the heart of doing that for, for many, many years. And as an editor, you, you've been a part of those stories, but uh, I guess the, 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 the context of that too, is that the result, the end result of this is that it's beautiful. And, and the reason why I say it in that way is because sometimes when we think of book, we, we, you're like, oh yeah, I mean, this is like, Oh, it's completely, I mean, I've got one sitting right over there that I pro that I'm going to be releasing tomorrow on the, on, on the podcast that there's not a single photo in the entire, uh, you know, tome it, it, it's, it's rich and, and in its description and its verbiage really brings the, the story to life. Um, but in, in your case, I mean, we've got beautiful photography in here and it's a very, very high quality book and the paper is very, very high quality. So, uh, it, it's so rich to be able to like, you know, enjoy the story and the images that, that come about. It was that something that was going to be very important for you to make sure that this was something that almost you, you would expect to see somebody have on a coffee table. Yeah, that was kind of the idea from the start for it to be like a miniature coffee table kind of book. And and um, yeah, maybe because I've been an editor at a magazine for so long that I think I appreciate what strong photography can do. And I know that like the experience of writing for me is so visceral that I think that words and photos together can um, connect with people in a way that words alone can't. And I, um, the principal photography in the book are, are is from uh, Jared and Ashley Gruber and John Watson, who are all people I've known and worked with and been friends with for a pretty long time. And they have kind of different folk focal points with, with the kind of riding photography they they do and so I felt like with them I could 
get really beautiful photography that like covered say 90% of what I wanted in the book. And, and I think that when I talk to people now who've seen the book, I think they understand the power of this photography because it's like, if it is like a love letter, this just makes it more emotional, right? When you look at a photo, um, like what I see on the screen right now, it's like people having fun. They're in a beautiful place. They're looks like they're on their bike at either the beginning or the end of the day as the sun is breaking over t- trees. And and there's just something so joyful and, and profound about the I- imagery that like underscores why we love this so, so much. Like it, it's like for me, and I think a lot of people riding is not, this is not a hobby. This is like a way of life for me. And, and so I w- want that emotional quality to come through in the imagery. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you use the joy word, which of, of course is, you know, part of the title in that it's, it's live to ride, finding joy and meaning on a bicycle. Yeah. And, and, um, you, you know, I, I think that part of this also came from my experience in the last few years on t- Twitter where, um, you know, I love a good debate or even an argument and, and things can get like so polemic and so ideological that I really um, wanted to do something just purely positive to really like cap, to really spend time kind of bathing in the things that I love about riding and, and, and uh, the things that unify everyone. Um, and that was a really positive experience for me that while I, you know, their advocacy, I think is like in this book in quiet ways, but it's not, this is not a book trying to like tell people why we need more bike lanes or why drivers are idiots, which I can do plenty of on Twitter. This is like about why we ride and like, right. So if you see um, a beautiful shot of someone riding in Copenhagen, there's, I think, a, a lot of like stealth advocacy in, in that kind of, it's like visual propaganda of like, well, this is like the dream. This is why we ride. And this is like, nobody's going to like have a, a photo of someone riding in a crappy shoulder in Los Angeles with people in Escalades going 60 miles an hour next to them. So this is like, there is advocacy in here, but it, but it's like framed in a really positive, you know, inspirational way. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the image that we have on screen right now is of course of the snake there in Copenhagen, which is just an absolutely gorgeous uh, bridge, cycling bridge that, uh, you know, connects, uh, it goes over the water, connects some critical areas there in the city of Copenhagen. And uh, it's, it's, I think it really is important to understand that the the whole reason why we're pushing so hard to try to create, transform our built environment into areas that are really safe and inviting and welcoming to everyone to ride is so that more people can, in fact, experience that joy and freedom and utility and all of these other things that you capture in the book. Yeah, I totally agree, obviously. And and one point I try and make a number of times in, in the book is, is that um, if everybody who rides realizes how much they have in common with everyone else who rides, even if their riding life is different, that we have so much more strength as a community and, and that it's not like, right? Like I know I've been a part of the advocacy community for a relatively long time. And it's easy to feel like you're in this battle by yourself in the advocacy community. But the reality is that now like roadies are riding to the coffee shop and have um, other kinds of bikes that they're um, riding in. And everybody is sharing this experience that the roads and their communities aren't as good as they could be for r- riding. And, and, and so the more that everybody like realizes that we're all just brothers and sisters r- riding, the more power we have to change things for the better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love the, the, the power in the imagery 
that comes out of, of Copenhagen because the Danes, especially there in, in Copenhagen, they don't even consider themselves cyclists. They just, yeah, th- this is just what we do. They don't even consider it a culture. They, they, it's just a pragmatic way of getting around. And, and it, it's, it's a, I think a, a great illustration and lesson for us all when we're, we're looking at trying to advocate for safer, more welcoming uh, places within our communities that accepts all different types of riders is to also understanding that we can sometimes like go overboard in our, <laughs> in our enthusiasm of, uh, of our tribes and of our groups. And I think you do a beautiful job of, of talking about that, giving, paying homage to the fact that yes, we, we, as human nature, we do naturally sort of get over there. But just like, as I mentioned, I can see myself in all six of those different buckets because I have, you know, yes, I have my racing bike. Yes, I have my mountain bike. Yes, I have my commuter bike. And yes, I have my travel bike and, and on and on and on and on and on. I see myself in all of those different layers, you know, a. a <laughs> A, a typical comment from from someone in the Netherlands or someone in 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 Denmark might be, well, I don't call myself a cyclist any more than I would call myself a vacuumist if I'm vacuuming my, my my you know my living room. Yeah, I think a lot of Americans are increasingly tuned in to that, and I often try to avoid the word cyclist because it's easy to be misunderstood. Like in some ways, I think. A cyclist can just be um, a person who rides a bike, but it, it, the term carries some historical baggage at this point in the U.S. And and I do think, you know, a, as you mentioned at the outset, my, my philosophy now is like if you're riding a bike, you're doing it right. And, and so you don't have to imagine yourself as like an enthusiast, right? It like has all these sporting con- connotations. Um, and, and I feel... Like I am a cyclist and I am a bike rider. And those are like two circles that intersect, but aren't exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, zooming in on a a photo of this is not in your book. (laughs) This is of of my good friends, the Bruntlets on vacation. Actually, they in this particular photo, they are actually on their family vacation in uh, Copenhagen of all places, although they now live in Delft in in the Netherlands. When I first met um, Chris and Melissa, when they were still living in the Vancouver area, the very first thing that they said to me was, why do you want to interview me, us? You know, we're not, we're not active. We're not sports people. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, no, no, no. I definitely want to interview you. You're, you're precisely the story that, that I want to talk about. And that is uh, activity, physical activity doesn't have to automatically be assumed that you're athletic or it's a sport related type of activity. Yeah. They're like a great inspiration uh, t- to me. And um, I don't know if I could think of anybody in bike culture that's been more relentlessly constructive than them, that um, you never will see them get in an argument with anyone. And they there's no hot takes from them. It's really like, it, it's like I have a couple of cookbooks in my kitchen where I know that if I pull them out, that I'm going to get this like really dependably great recipe of how to make something that I'm going to want. And I feel like that's what their content is like, is like a cookbook of full of dependable recipes to make things better. And, um, and they really have impacted by culture on uh, multiple continents by doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And they are authors of two fabulous books the, themselves, and uh, we'll be sure to uh, uh, leave those uh, links in the show notes below. Um, the reason why I'm actually zooming in is not not to, to diss Enrique, who is their, their tour guide, but I'm actually focusing in on the person who is behind them, sort of uh, doing a little, um, uh, a little uh, photo bomb there, because she's on a mobility trike. And, and that really sort of emphasizes what I try to uh, reinforce when we talk about cycling infrastructure 
we're not talking about this being something that is for again, the cyclists, the people who stereotypically we think of, we're really talking about safe and inviting all ages and all abilities. And we see somebody getting around on a, an ability a tricycle there. Yeah. I, it, um, if I'm honest that I, I used to like um, ride and see people on like recumbents or trikes and just kind of be struck by their otherness. And now I feel something so radically different that like when like I ride on the beach path on the way to work um, in L.A. And there's a lot of people who are on um, recumbents and trikes. And I just feel like, man, we're just in this together on a slightly different machine. And the reasons why we're out here are the same damn reasons. And, and so I'm like a little embarrassed to think that I used to like make jokes about dudes on recumbents like you know and and um just like i made jokes about triathletes or a certain kind of mountain biker and it was always good natured but but that that like i leaned into that um segmentation and now i just feel like a real genuine sort of love for everyone who r rides like it's still like this big group of weirdos who lo love to do this thing. And, and I just feel like, yeah, we're all family. Yeah. And if we're, if we really are successful, then we're not going to be a big group of weirdos. We'll, it will get to the point just like they have in the Netherlands, as well as in uh, a, a large part of Denmark and many other places. It's just, yeah, it's just another mobility mode. It, it's not an otherness. It's just like, yeah. Oh yeah. That it's a practical way to get around. And sometimes it's a great way to recreate and experience nature and, and dot, 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 all these other aspects of it. Yeah. It's almost otherworldly when you make it sound that s simple, right? Like I, I totally agree with you and I often just get frustrated why it's not happening faster in um, North America. Cause it, it just feels like in my lifetime, I presume that everything will get better in a continual way. But I, I sort of imagine that when I'm done riding, I'll still feel like a weirdo um, just because of like how much resistance there is to just like accepting all these joys and meanings of bike culture. Like we're going to get more mainstream and we're going to, riding will be safer and more popular. But I still think like 20 years from now that we'll still feel like weirdos. That's just my guess. Love yeah, to be I don't wrong know. I, yeah, it's, I hope, hopefully you're wrong on that. Hopefully we won't still be considered weirdos on that. What's really, really interesting about too, where you happen to live and uh, before we hit the record button, you know, I divulged that, you know, I used to hang out there uh, all the time in, in the South Bay area. Um, I learned how to surf while I was attending uh, USC for undergrad uh, right there at 30th Street in uh, Hermosa Beach and then spent a, a lot of time surfing all up and down the area there. Uh, especially El Porto, which uh, you had mentioned that you ride right past on your way to the office. What's really great about uh, a path like that, which has been a vibrant path you know, ever since I was there in the early 80s, is that you do see all types. And you mentioned it, you know, with the tr mobility trikes and other recumbents and things like that. That's the point is that when you do have a safe and inviting infrastructure and a network of that infrastructure is you have a, a, a broader diversity of the overall population, you know, that's doing that. And the process of building out our network is, you know, it, it's money at some point. It's political will, certainly. But when we look to the experience there in the Netherlands that, uh, you know, the, the Brentlets have so eloquently discussed in their books, it's, it's not out of reach. I mean, they essentially transformed their built environment um, over basically a, a five decade period. The majority of their infrastructure has actually been built. I think it's some 70 to 80 percent of the of the network has been built since the 1990s. So there's yeah I, I, yeah no no I, I definitely think the transformation is possible here and will ha happen here I think it's all a question of just like how long it's going to take and how many 
people will be scared off from riding in the meantime. And, and, and so I feel attuned to, to it. I think it's like to be in a place like Los Angeles, it's impossible not to be attuned to it, right? Like I, I, um, I ride my bicycle to work and it's like almost always beautiful weather and the car trip from where I live to where I work is horrible. Like everyone walks into the office just like hating life and then wondering when they're going to get some time to like work out or think, you know, without, um, you know, being assaulted by um, the world. And, and I get all of those things. And uh, so, so it, it's, uh, there, there are a lot of like, institutional challenges that will need to be overcome, but I totally think they will happen. I think just the, there's all these forces that are happening that will make it happen because the, you know, the bike is the answer to so many questions. And, and so I just feel like it'll happen. But I think if you ride a lot in a city in the U S it's easy to get frustrated at the pace it's happening. Right. I get that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, and as somebody who has, you know, basically five decades, close to five decades worth of experience also riding uh, in in Southern California, I can say that in, in when I visit Southern California, I usually travel with my my traveling bicycle. So I've got my Brompton with me. I'll fly into LAX. I'll take the little shuttle bus over so that I can get on whatever the train is, the green train or whatever. And, and then make my way into, into the downtown LA area. I usually get off the train there um, near the USC campus so I can ride on my bike through campus and remember the glory days of being there in the 80s. But then I'll ride my bike from, from USC campus into the downtown LA uh, area, uh, taking in the protected bike lane along Figueroa. Um, I was actually there documenting it uh, right after they opened it and NACTO was was there, had their, their annual meeting there. Jump on the train again, go through Pasadena, head out to where my relatives are out in Gl- the Glendora area. And I'm really noticing that that's one of the great things that a lot of people don't know about the LA metro area is that it is the fastest mover in terms of the total number of miles of uh, rail transit that's being built out and really helping to facilitate. And this is really the the thing that I love the most about the Dutch network is that you have an overlay of being able to get on a train, do that longer trip, then you get off the train and then you've got an integrated cycle network. And so the fact that they're building out the, the Metro line and hopefully they will catch up and build a little bit more quickly, as you were talking about, alluding to that bicycle network that is considered an all ages and abilities type of bicycle network, as well as taking advantage of the quiet residential streets, which is oftentimes the hidden beauty of, uh, of the, the Dutch system and the Danish system is that the, the 60 to 70 percent of their cycle network is actually some form of shared space where there's low traffic and, and low uh, speed environment. Right. I think L.A. has got because you, you mentioned it, it's got the great weather. So the, the potential, yeah, the is, potential so is potential is super high. I like in the last year I've um, got this new hobby of like trying to concoct um, long bike rides that involve a train. Um, and so I've like looked at uh, Met- Metrolink as sort of the longer distance uh, commuter rail system. And I just look at what the end of each of the lines are and whether I can just like ride a bike there and then take a train home. So I've like ridden to San Bernardino and ridden down to Oceanside and, you know, going places where rather than trying to do a round trip where I loop back to where I started, I just end at a train station and can like buy a bunch of stuff at 7-Eleven and sit on a plane and uh, a train and, and recuperate and enjoy the ride. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I was just up in, in Santa Barbara documenting um, the build out of their uh, bicycle network because they're really moving fast yeah. uh, to try to, to, to do a better job there. And I was interviewing some of the city staff there and we were talking about the fact that, yeah, you can like catch the train, 
come on up from LA, get off of the train. And their dream is to be able to have, you know, safe and inviting infrastructure that, you know, can get people around and you can explore the entire city. Yeah, it's a great city to ride in. I think a lot of university towns are kind of ahead of, of like other, other, other towns. Um, you know, I think a lot of ways, just like anywhere where there's a lot of young people who are like just more open to things being different and better. There's like less of this, um, you know, sort of baby boomer status quo oriented people who, you know, have a harder time thinking about the positives of change. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that we haven't mentioned yet about the book, the narrative storylines that you want to make sure to leave the audience with? Well, I, I guess we didn't talk much about n- nature. And I would say that like, even for people who live in cities, this is a really important element of, 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 of riding that I think our lives have just become so busy and so digitized that, um, that feeling of like whether for me it's riding along the ocean or someone who goes to a city park to just do a few laps that, um, you know, we're really needing connection to the outdoors. Um, we're needing to feel like alive and aware of like the weather and the terrain and the wind. And I think there's something really primal and important in, in like experiencing the, the natural world on a, on a bike that, 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 um, I totally get why people go to a gym and do, um, you know, uh, a spin class or they ride in the winter and do Zwift. And so I, I just, the efficiency of, of that is, um, great, but I think being outside and riding is is such a beautiful thing that most people who ride really ap- appreciate that even like right like our our apparel choices you can be comfortable in a really wide range of weather and environments and and there's like there's something about it that makes you feel alive and um and I'm I'm just like aware of that all all the time of 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 like how I feel sustained in my riding by being, you know, in in the natural world. I'm really glad that you brought that up and mentioned that it, it, it harkens back to some conversations that I've had with uh, Ryan Van Duzer, who has a a wonderful channel um, out here on, on, on YouTube that, and he talks about that a lot. He does these adventure videos and, and really talks about how that getting that connectivity and connection to nature. And he always tries to capture a little bit of that beauty, uh, you know, from his in, you know, from his adventures. So it's not just, it's not adrenaline, this and all that. It's like taking that deep breath, taking the time to appreciate it. And sometimes that, that glimpse of nature can be a a part of just your daily routine too. Um, I can remember beautiful mornings there in Manhattan beach, especially in the wintertime after a big storm or something and the wind would whip through across the sand and create like this corduroy effect uh, on the sand. And, and even before a very first, you know, footstep ever even touched it. And it's just, it's one of the things that we have a chance to appreciate when we're moving, you know, closer to human speed, when we're moving at 10 miles an hour on the bike path and we're like, Oh, wow, this is just extraordinarily beautiful and powerful. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, um, my wife has a car and I have some, uh, responsibilities that involve me driving. And the way I think about it is that like, when I'm driving a car, I feel like I'm watching a movie. And when I'm riding my bike, I feel like I'm in the movie and, 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 and it's like, just like you're, you're part of it. Uh, you you know, and it's not all just nature. It's like, you know, when I, when I, ride by the taco trucks in LA. I smell the taco trucks. I hear all the languages that people are talking as they're walking around. I like smell the fresh cut grass as guys are working on people's lawns. It's, it's, um, you know, it's not like I'm in this living room listening to a podcast, no offense to podcasts. It's just like, I'm out there experiencing the world I live in and it's really easy to get disconnected from that. Like the bicycle is an incredible way to make you feel 
more connected to where you are. Yeah. Yeah. And the, it, it's, it's powerful to, to have that opportunity to have that presence and, and be able to be right there in the moment. And you, you mentioned the, the, the headphones um, and, and listening to things. I tend to listen to my podcast when I'm just sort of walking uh, in my neighborhood around here. But when I try to have my weekly run in the trail, I always make sure that I'm not wearing headphones. I want to be in the moment. I want to be present. I want to hear the birds because that's part of, you know, activating all of our senses. I get the sense that you do that when you ride too. You're not listening to things. Yeah. It's almost, um, hard for me to explain. Like I, I spend a lot of time on my bike and I never listen to content or music. You know, I, I, I just, um, it's, I think it would, to me, it would be like if someone was really into say yoga, you, like they wouldn't listen to music or a podcast when they do it. It's like, there's something more than just a physical activity happening. And so I want to be like, I want to be present in a certain sort of way. And I want to be like lost mentally in a certain sort of way. Like a lot of times I'm just mulling over things in my life and things with work. And when I, I get to work and I take a shower and suddenly like three ideas are in my head. And that's because of like the way I'm open to it and the flow state I'm in from riding. And so I, yeah, I wouldn't want to be listening uh, to, 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 I love, I, I don't, there's nothing boring about it to me. And also like riding in LA, I think I just want to be a hundred percent like tuned in to what's going on around me. It's not at all like a ride in the park. The, the, the one other thing I'll say that we didn't talk about was um, self-expression, which was like the hardest chapter to write because it's really about a few di different things. Like part of it superficially is just about this way in which like fashion has seeped into riding culture where you can wear whatever you want. And there's just like more ways to just be your true self when you're on a bike, but on a deeper level, it becomes the sense of like about tolerance and equity and about being open to not just your own ability to express yourself on your bike, but to just accept everybody else who's different than you expressing themselves on a, on a bike. And I've seen in the last four or five years, like a lot of positive change and a lot of friction around that latter topic. And so wanted to like do some thinking about, ab about that, right? Like th th that all manner of people who um, are, have like different life circumstances and have different choices and a different lifestyle, a different life are riding and, and that to just like lean as far away from those differences as po possible to, to, um, to really think that everybody's just trying to find their way and the bike is this tool to help them feel whole. And, and so I do, I do think that's about as ideological and polemic as the book gets. And even then, I think it's hopefully a soft t touch, but, but it's like this idea of, of acceptance right? Like that, that bike advocacy is part of this larger advocacy movement of just like wanting everyone to feel safe in their lives, whether they're on a bike or off a bike. And so if you're talking about bike advocacy, you have to think about what life is like off the bike for a lot of people. And, and, and so the chapter gets into some, some, some of that of like how these beautiful challenges that our culture are wrestling with, how they play out in bike culture. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we the the image that we have on here on screen right now is an expression of that a little bit in the sense that you know this is the the bike life sort of movement and the joy, uh, especially in the inner cities of you know people expressing themselves. They they you can kind of look and see that they've they they have customized their bikes. They love their bikes. They get together. They have a hoot. They have a fun a, a great deal of fun while doing it. Um, but as you mentioned too, you know, the, the expression chapter really goes into a, a, a diversity of different themes and, and really, to, you know, embraces, uh, you know, again, that cross-section of 
the diversity that exists out on our streets and in our cities as it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it's understood almost unspoken that everyone who rides thinks doing wheelies is cool. And, um, I, I cannot personally do a dependable wheelie. And so I feel great admiration and envy for those kids. And, um, you know, to live in a, in an urban area where, um, you don't have the easiest access to the kind of riding that a lot of other people take for granted and to like carve out this really artistic culture that has like this um, political element to it. I think it's a, I think bike life is a beautiful thing. And, and I'm like just so happy that I consider those, those men and women like my brothers and sisters. Like, I think it's so cool. And um, I think there's a lot of like, elements of bike culture that are like that, that I just want to like bring in and, and not think of as other. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I love too, is like when there's a mashup of different identities and different cultures. And uh, I noticed this when I lived in Southern California. And I also noticed it when I lived in, in Hawaii is that, you know, I would be like, oh yeah, I, I love to ride and oh yeah. I love to ride both my surfboard and my bike. And I love that utility of being able to uh, throw the the board on the bike and be able to get, you know, go check out the different uh, surf breaks and see what's happening and, and connect with, you know, friends and other people that, you know, are, are actual friend friends, but other people who you recognize and, and they're, they're sort of like, Oh yeah, the, the recognized stranger that you don't really know their name, but you always say, hi, there's a certain level of social cohesion that comes from, from that and being able to, to travel closer at human speed. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, that the whole um, culture of surfing and riding together is such a beautiful thing. Um, I think in a place like Manhattan Beach, or maybe even more at a place like San Clemente, that um, you realize at some point the utility of a bike is like off the charts, right? Like that in Manhattan Beach, where I live, there's one popular break that's got a giant parking lot. And so it's always really crowded, but there are spots that are like a mile or two away that are just as good. And if you have a bike that can take a surfboard, you suddenly can access things that like are challenging with a car and, and, um, right. Like this way in which like, so I get in all these polemic arguments on, on Twitter where people are like, well, let's see you get a, go to home Depot and buy like, you know, hundred cinder blocks and get those home on your bike. And it's like, uh, okay. Um, But there are tons of things where the bike is the optimal way to do something with utility, right? Like I live like three quarters of a mile from a Trader Joe's that always has like a million people circling the parking lot, looking for a, a space and hating themselves. And I'm like, a VIP where I roll up to the front door and park my bike and walk, walk in. And it's like undoubtedly the fastest, least stressful way to shop at Trader Joe's. And there's thousands of examples of things like that, where the bike is, um, triumphal. Yeah. Carry a huge plant for instance, right? You there can, you go. that oh. turn is so sweet. I love that bike. I love that bike too. Yeah, that is my bike. <laughs> that's just that's the turn uh, GSD with the uh, the Gates uh, belt drive on there, um, and it's it's a workhorse. And and yeah, talking about you know going uh, rolling to the grocery store, and yeah, I can easily you know pick up two hundred and fifty dollars worth of groceries and and get it up the steep hill uh, up to the house uh, here uh, in in South Austin and. Uh, yeah, and I'm really glad that that the conversation went in this direction because it it talks a little bit about the the power of electric assist and what it can do for us because honestly with North America with the distances that we have uh in front of us it does put us at a little bit more of a disadvantage when we do, you know, city by city comparisons uh to a, a place like Delft in the Netherlands where Chris and Melissa and the family live. And so having that little bit of electric assist really helps 
<laughs> flatten those hills, <laughs> decrease the amount of of strain that that's that that uh, that steep wind in your face can can do. Talk a little bit about that perspective, because I suspect that you probably have had a little bit of a shift in your own view of of what electric in e-assist bikes have been, you know, over the period. I know I have. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I, I first um, tried e-bikes when I was working at bicycling. So these were you know, like 12, 13 years ago. And at the time, they seemed like fun toys, right? And I thought that I always thought they were cool, but they seemed like recreational t- toys. And I didn't see the full u- utility. And so, yeah, my perspective has changed. Um, I, I, uh, I have a, a Benno uh, cargo bike, and I use it a little bit less than I did a few years ago because I'm, I'm just in a mode of like feeling fit and just liking to do everything on a conventional bike. But there have been times where it was really important vehicle in my life. And, um, and I do think this old trope that a lot of road cyclists have that e-bikes are cheating somehow is like got to be one of the dumber tropes in bike culture right like you're being like we're in a culture where people like get in a six thousand pound suv and like drive to starbucks and get drive through and then drive home right like being on a pedal assist bike is not cheating in any way and and that for all the emotional things i talk about in the book of like the reasons why you ride they all apply like it's everyone who rides an e-bike knows they're on a bike Right, like you, the, all of the the physics and the emotions are the same, and and that it gives like a wider range of people a sense of what our infrastructure is like and how and what driving culture is is like. I, yeah, it's all po- positives as far as I'm concerned, and and feel like usually when I hear people complaining about e-bikes, they've never ridden one. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, this has been so much fun. <laughs> I want to pull. I want to pull up uh, uh, the the book here. Uh, this is my bookshop. This is the Active Towns bookshop, and I've got your book right here uh, on the podcast featured books, right next to uh, Chris and Melissa's two books, "Curbing Traffic" and "Building the Cycling City." And uh, folks, pick up this book. This is a fantastic book. The publisher Hachette Book Group. Again, Live to Ride, Finding Joy and Meaning on a Bicycle. Peter Flax, this has been such a joy having you on the Active Towns Podcast. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. We kind of went over just such a wide range of topics. It's been a great conversation. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to do. Become an Active Towns ambassador. Uh, Just click on the link down below at activetowns.org. Then click on the support button. There's several different options, including becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, all patrons do get early and ad-free access to all my videos. Uh, and hey, thank you all so much for tuning in today. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.